This is another uh, tale of Michigan. This is about, uh, it's a little adventure um, that tells a little about um, my late and such wonderful husband, Fred Sonic Smith. So this is a little story about me and Fred. Fred and I had no specific time frame. In 1979, we lived at the Book Cadillac Hotel in downtown Detroit. We lived around the clock, moving through the days and nights with little regard for time. We would stay up until dawn talking, then sleep until nightfall. When we awoke, we'd search for 24-hour diners or stop and mill around Art Van's furniture outlet that opened at midnight and served free coffee and powdered donuts. <laughs> Thrills. <laughs> Thrilling fun. <laughs> Sometimes we just drive aimlessly and stop before the sun rose at some motel in a place like Port Huron or Saginaw and sleep all day. Fred loved the arcade bar that was close to our hotel. It opened in the morning, a 30-style bar with a few booths, a grill, and a large railway clock with no hands. There was no real time, anything, no time real or otherwise at the arcade, and we could sit for hours with a handful of stragglers, spinning words or content within commiserating silence. Fred would have a couple of beers, and I would drink black coffee. On one such morning at the arcade bar, as he gazed at the great wall clock, Fred suddenly got an idea for a TV show. These were the early days of cable, and he envisioned broadcasting on WGPR, Detroit's pioneering black independent television station. Fred's segment, drunk in the afternoon, <laughs> fell in the realm of the clock with no hands, unfettered by time and social expectations. It would feature one guest who would join him at the table beneath the clock, just drinking and talking. They could go on as far as their mutual intoxication would take them. Fred could communicate well on any subject, from Tom Watson's golf swing, to the Chicago riots, to the decline of the railroad. Fred made a list of possible guests from all walks of life. On the top of his list was Cliff Robertson. <laughs> you can Google him. <laughs> a somewhat troubled B actor who shared Fred's enthusiasm for aviation. Cliff Robertson, a man close to his heart. Depending on how long it was going, at unspecified intervals, I would have a 15-minute segment called Coffee Break. <laughs> the idea that Nescafe would sponsor my segment. I would not have guests, but invite the viewers to have a cup of Nescafe with me. <laughs> On the other hand, Fred and his guests would not be obliged to communicate with the viewer, only with each other. I went as far as to find and purchase the perfect uniform for my segment. In fact, in I think it's the November issue of Harper's Bazaar, there's um, pictures of me in this very dress, <laughs> taken, I think, in the mid-90s but you can see that it was really a dress that really existed. <laughs> Even though the TV show didn't exist, the dress existed. <clears throat> I went as far to find and purchase the perfect uniform for my segment, a gray and white striped linen dress that buttoned down the front with cap sleeves and two pockets. French penitentiary style. <laughs> Fred decided he would wear his khaki shirt with a dark brown tie. On coffee break, I planned to discuss prison literature, <laughs> highlighting writers like Jean Genet and Albertine Sarrazin. On drunk in the afternoon, 
Fred might offer his guests some extremely fine cognac from a brown paper bag. <laughs> Not all dreams are meant to be realized. <laughs> that was what Fred used to say. We accomplish things that no one would ever know. Unexpectedly, when we return from French Guiana, you can learn about that in chapter one. <laughs> He decided to learn to fly. In 1981, we drove to the Outer Banks of North Carolina to salute America's first airfield at the Wright Brothers Memorial, taking US Highway 158 to Kill Devil Hills. We then made our way along the southern coastline, moving from flight school to flight school. We journeyed through the Carolinas to Jacksonville, Florida, to Fernandina Beach, American Beach, Daytona Beach, and then we circled back to St. Augustine. There we stayed in a motel by the sea with a small kitchenette. Fred flew and drank Coca-Cola. I wrote and drank coffee. We bought miniature vials of the water discovered by Ponce de Leon, a <laughs> hole in the ground gushing the supposed water of youth. Let's never drink it, he said and the vials became part of our trove of impossible treasure. For a time, we considered buying an abandoned lighthouse or a shrimp trawler. But when I found out I was pregnant, we headed back home to Detroit, trading one set of dreams for another. Fred finally achieved his pilot's license, but couldn't afford to fly a plane. I wrote incessantly, but published nothing. Through it all, we held fast to the concept of the clock with no hands. Tasks were completed, sump pumps manned, sandbags piled, trees planted, shirts ironed, hems stitched, and yet we reserved the right to ignore the hands that kept on turning. Looking back, long after his death, our way of living seems a miracle, one that could only be achieved by the silent synchronization of the jewels and gears of a common mind. <laughs>